everybody. Welcome to the Dice Tower Top 10. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. Hello. And I'm Tim Mativier from Las Vegas. Now, Tim may be unknown to some of you, but he should not be. He's well known for three reasons. One, he runs Meepleville, a board game cafe in Las Vegas. That is true. He also runs an extremely popular YouTube channel with billions of views. Uh, where... <laughs> wow. I've been holding out, Tim. Wow, yes. <laughs> so what's the name of your YouTube channel? Someone's looking for it. Meepleville. Yes, Meepleville. Meepleville Board Game Cafe. And really, folks, Tim has done some really exceptional interviews there. And he puts up, what, like two a week at, at this point now or something? I have been, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've been trying to build it. You know, it's a lot of work. It's uh, fun. It's interesting. And someday I hope to be like you, Tom. <laughs> ah. All right. But... The third thing is that Tim runs Dice Tower West. That is or true. He's, he's one of the folk, folks who runs Dice Tower West. He and his partner, Dave. Uh, mm -hmm. But Tim is the guy who goes around and makes – he's the smiler and the frowner, right? The, the guy who tells you good job or get moving. That's right. A man of many hats. Got to wear them both. Tim has so a long – So you do want to be like Tom, a man of many hats. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with, with, uh, yeah, a man of many hats, but actually not wearing the hats. Yeah. Oh, Okay, we'll let somebody else do that. Um, Tim also has had a long, storied, interesting life, including having been a comedian at one point. Um, so I expect you to be funny today. <laughs> That's subjective, whether I was really a comedian, so make people laugh. But yeah, no, I had a lot of, uh, did a lot of different things in my life, had a good life. I've uh, been very fortunate. So uh, yeah, I've been happy. It's good. And then I get to I, uh, I have found a repertoire of one liner and good dad jokes. And I've been trying to drop them in a conversation with my kids and it's been going over swimmingly terrible. Um, so I'm gonna keep doing it. Yeah, keep doing it. Good, good and dad jokes don't go together. <laughs> All righty, well, I have no good segue here. So today we're talking about trick-taking games. Um, trick-taking games is a really interesting segment of board games. Some people do not like them at all. Mm -hmm. Some people, my daughter, Melody, she loves heavy, heavy Euro games, and she cannot wrap her mind around a trick-taking game. But that's because when she grew up, I taught her heavy Euro games rather than trick-taking games. It's almost it's almost a learned thing, I think. Did you play – either one of you play trick-taking games growing up? A little bit, yeah. As a kid, uh, we played uh, some of the Spanish trick-taking games, like from Spain, I mean – so, yeah, a little bit. So it was not a completely foreign concept when I was growing up. Yeah, I played a lot of them also. A lot of spades, uh, things like that. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's just one of those things that I don't I – was, I was trying to explain it to Roy the other day. I just – when I play a trick-taking game, my mind gets into this groove. It's this weird mindset. I'm sitting there. I'm thinking about all the cards everyone else is holding. It's a it's a different experience than any other board game that's that's out there, I feel. Um, mm -hmm. To the point where if a trick taking game goes too far off the rails, it throws me because I have such a set way that I think when it comes to these games. No, I I, I would agree a hundred percent, and the reason why. I really like trick-taking games, especially with a regular deck of cards, is because you have a finite um, – uh, you have a – there's 52 cards, right? It's finite. So in the more advanced trick-taking games, it comes into counting you know, exactly how many cards of a suit have been played and all that kind of stuff. So you can really, really you know, uh, narrow down the information to make the most effective play because of the finiteness, if that's a correct term, of the 52 cards. So, yeah, I really, really like um, the thinking that's involved in trick-taking games. Hmm. That's more than I usually think about trick-taking games, but I totally understand <laughs> that people who are good at them will absolutely use that information. Uh, and I like that aspect of it. I think I agree with you, too, uh, Tom, that, yes, there is a certain cadence and sort of, you know, puts you in a certain sort of delta wave pattern in your brain when you're playing a trick-taking game. It's a different vibe. Absolutely. And that's why if someone t tells me, if I play a trick-taking game with somebody and they don't like it, I almost kind of write off trick-taking games with that person. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just it's not something you'll like. Well, you'll learn to like it. Uh, you know, it's just it's maybe if you'd learn to play it as a kid, but I don't know that I would keep playing them to get it. Right. Right. Trick taking games are also they're weirdly popular, um, but at the same time they're popular. They're not as popular in the gaming part of things. Like at conventions, you don't see a lot of trick taking games getting played. You do not. Correct. I think a lot of people who like trick-taking games would consider, would very strongly consider trick-taking games and board games to be separate things. You know, um, they don't really get lumped into the same category. You know, card games, trick-taking games, that's its own thing. Or you like board gaming, that's something That's something else. That's kind of a different hobby almost, you know. I, I agree 100%, but I also think at cons... Not only trick-taking games, because if you're going to talk about maybe a regular deck of cards, like, you know, spades, hearts, euchre, pinochle, you don't see a lot of cribbage, chess, backgammon either. Ah, so, that's true. You, know, you don't see a lot of classic board games or those kind of games being played at conventions either. Right. So my list, just to be clear, and I, I, I'm not enforcing this on everyone else, so I just said trick-taking games. But for me, I distinctly feel that there's a difference between trick-taking games and what is commonly known as uh, shedding card games or ladder climbing games. <laughs> now, I, I do think there's one game that actually fits into both categories, and I would not be surprised if that game shows up today. But, um, yeah, that, that's just something I did on my own. On my own. I, think, I think I know what game you mean. Uh, it's not going to show up on my list, but I think I know what you mean. Yeah, and I agree 100%. They are different styles of games. Shedding games, ladder climbing games, typically the same thing. Um, and then <laughs> trick, you know, those two, and then trick taking games are a different thing. Absolutely. And there's even that sort of fine line between, well, if you play face down and then reveal the card, is that a trick taking game? There's some sort of, there's a little nebulous area there, right? Where I, I normally say, no, you got, I have to know what I'm playing to, like, what I'm following around the table. So, but I could see some people arguing for the, the, you know, the other interpretation. That is true. And I've had this discussion and this argument because I'm, I'm on uh, the side of both of you guys. However, I, I found out that, I'm, that we're wrong, I think I'm wrong, that even though a game that is a shedding game, it is technically defined as a trick-taking game. Because my whole argument was, well, if you're not, if your intention is to not take the trick, sort of, or like it doesn't have a benefit by taking the trick, then it's not essentially a trick-taking game. Mm. That's interesting. Well, the easiest way to do this is let's just start going through and see what comes up. I'm going to say we will have not a ton of crossover here. I think ZME may have a couple, and maybe I have one or two with Tim. Not if I can help I it. Huh? <laughs> not if I can help it. Well, yeah, I'm cr- if you say one that was on my list, I'm crossing it off. There you go. All right, here we go. Let's start with number 10. <laughs> number 10. All right, my number 10 pick is a uh, a game that actually just had a second edition not too long ago. I think they just cleaned up some of the look of the game. And this is from designer Mike Fitzgerald. I'm talking here about Diamonds. Yeah, Diamonds is uh, one I assume will show up a little bit later. It's a, it's one that's been out for a few years now. It straddled a nice line between modern trick-taking game yet feeling fairly classic in its uh, style and the way things develop. It's a very attractive game. It's well-made, and I like the idea of the scoring, essentially, being folded into the mechanisms of the game. In most trick-taking games you play, then just figure out what scoring is assigned to what. This jack is worth this much. Each trick is worth that, that. In this one, the suit abilities tie into scoring. You get gems. You put them into your vault, which means they are safe, and so on and so on. I like the um, the idea that in this trick-taking game, being able to not follow suit, so basically playing off-suit, gets you a little something extra. So short-suiting yourself whenever possible, is interesting and ideal because you can get a bonus action out of being able to do that. I like it. It's interesting. Uh, easy to play, enjoyable, diamonds. That's my number 10. Yeah, I like diamonds. It it was my 11 or 12. Uh, really, uh, it, It's hard to make a classic 
game in a sense, right? We already have hearts and spades. Yeah. And Mike Fitzgerald did diamonds, and I think North Star tried to do clubs. Clubs was, I thought, a distant didn't wasn't didn't come as close. But diamonds feels like it's been around for fifty years almost. Right. Yeah, it's absolutely well thought out, and I agree with Z actually about uh, the fact of that game that you can lose the trick like if you know you can't follow suit and you're losing the trick you can still benefit so i just think right, that's right. a very interesting mechanic for that and then the bonus for the person who wins the trick of course is they get the uh, majority of the cards in the suit bonus you know at the end when you're counting up how many cards but yeah just the fact that you can lose but still benefit is really interesting yeah yeah absolutely all right what do you got tim for my number 10 i have Fox in the Forest. Uh, Fox in the oh, Forest. Oh, people uh, in chat were predicting this one. What's that? What'd you say? The people in chat were predicting this one. For me? Well, I think just that someone would say it. Oh, that someone would say it. Okay. Um, yeah, Fox in the Forest is a very good uh, two-player game. I think it's very clean, very simple um, as far as how it's played and what you can play. And I just uh, really enjoy it for a good sort of light intro-ish two-player trick-taking game all right i agree this, with everything you said this is uh one that's not on my list actually so huh. um right. maybe on my list well i haven't played it actually is what i should have said more specifically my number 10 is my only uh public domain game on the list and i don't know why it just keeps making the list and that's hearts okay now, there is actually a intellectual property version of this, Uno Hearts, uh, which I have played and liked. But I, I like Hearts. Now, I prefer playing Hearts where the 10 of – it's a 10 of clubs, right? Because the Queen of Spades is thir negative 13, right? Correct. So it's, a, mm -hmm. it's the Jack of Clubs then, which is a positive 10. I really like playing that way um, just because there's the one positive card that's thrown into the mix. But – Queen's Queen, I mean, Hearts is a trick-taking game where you necessarily do not want to win tricks. In fact, you don't unless you're trying to get them all. It introduces that idea of shoot the moon, which I love. Yep. Um, and this is not the only game on my list that has that in it. Uh, I like shooting the moon. I've done it maybe twice in my life, you know, <laughs> but it feels good when you pull it off. Uh, I played a lot of Hearts online when Windows came out. You know, it had three games. Minesweeper, Hearts, and Solitaire. So I played a lot of Hearts back then. But I still, I don't know. I just like it. So my number 10, Hearts. Hmm. All right. Number nine. All right. I uh, don't, I don't think I have uh, any on my list that are those public domain ones. But if I was going to pick one, it'd probably be uh, either Pitch or Euchre. Anyway, my number nine is a remake of Dragon Master from back in the day. This is Indulgence from Restoration Games. It's uh, it's uh, one of those games in which you you pick goals and then you try for those goals. Uh, Bruno Faduti had a game similar to this some time ago. I forget exactly what his is called. Goblin something or... The Goblin anyway. King or... What is that one? The Yeah, the King. one where you were... You Dwarf had to, like, King. Dwarf King, that's it. Dwarf King, yeah, yeah. That one is uh, neat. It's a three-suited trick-taking game, but um, Indulgence feels a little more traditional. It uses some of the same ideas. Pick a goal, try to go for that goal. Sometimes you want tricks, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you want specific cards, all of that stuff. There is an aspect of shooting the moon a little bit in, in Indulgence as well. Uh, but I like this one. Every trick that you play, every hand, I should say, that you play feels a little bit different, which I enjoy in a trick-taking game, especially one that's a little longer. Uh, but you don't always, you know, things just don't always go your way, and you are attempting to sometimes just spoil someone else's attempt at something. And that can be fun I would never do that. Well. My Sitting, goal is only to help myself and not hurt others. Setting yourself as the antagonist for a hand can be pretty fun. So that's my number nine, Indulgence, and it's a beautiful production, too. All right, Tim, what do you got? Well, my number nine, uh, and I'll be perfectly honest, totally up front, 
I don't know if it's necessarily an, on my list because I love it so much or in ninth place, but it just really intrigues me, and I do like the idea behind it, and that is Pococo. Now, the reason this is on my list is What's because – Pococo? Okay. Uh, the reason it's on my list, first of all, it's a beautiful-looking game with the peacocks and the way it sets up when you put the cards mm -hmm. in to simulate the feathers. But it has that whole, you know, uh, Hanabi aspect or whatever where you can't see your cards and you have to play off the player to the left. And so it's got that level. Then it's got the level of sort of the betting, how many tricks you think that person will make. So it's got that. It, it's just got a lot of very intriguing aspects about it. Again, I, not necessarily because of this game I really love or love to play, but I do like it, do enjoy it. But just the concept I find fascinating. This is unfortunately one that escaped me. I never did get around to playing it. It came out a, a few years ago, like three years ago maybe, right? And mm -hmm. I just – I meant to play it. I liked the idea, like you said, the uh, sort of look of it being the feathers of the, the, the peacocks. But I never did get around to playing it. It reminded me of this little-known trick-taking game called uh, – or based on Jekyll and Hyde. I think it's called Jekyll and Hyde. Where other people, you would make other people play for you. So this idea of like, no, you play for me. On you know, on my turn, you'd pull a card and play it. Uh, I I, I want to go back and play it though, and this puts it back on my list. I uh, definitely intend to do that. It's almost, point. it's almost too out there for me. The idea that I'm playing someone else's cards for them. The it looks great. I mean, it's really great looking. Uh, I don't know. It's almost too esoteric for me. And I felt it to be a little clunkier because I like trick-taking games. To do, I'm just playing card. You know, I don't want to have to sit there and the fiddliness of picking a card to play, I, I thought, made it a decent game, but I didn't love it as much as Tim does. No, no, okay. no. I'm like, you know. No, you love it. It's on your list. <laughs> you love it. Yeah, like I said, it, it really is because it's so – I just think it's so unique and fascinating that, uh, yeah, it has a little soft spot. I love it a little. How about that? <laughs> I believe my number nine Z taught to me. It's called No. I'm sorry, not No. Nyet. <laughs> oh, I, I, taught, I taught you Nyet? Really? Because it's I've been out for a while. Really? Well, this was – Back at uh, The Rock, I thought you taught it to me. Okay, that um, might be. That could very well be. This was a long... Yeah, this is a game in which it's... You are picking... There's this bidding phase, which... Actually, this might be higher on my list. If this bidding phase didn't slow the game down, I feel just a tad at the beginning, where you're essentially picking some of the rules, including what Trump is going to be over the course of the, the game. And I kind of like that because you're looking at the cards in your hand and I'm saying, well, Trump is definitely not going to be this suit. And we keep saying that until everything is determined. And then you play it out. And it's the ye yellow made a version of this, which is a really beautiful uh, version of it. It has you know, a Russian bear on it. I, I don't know. I just like how that looks. So I, I'm sure that has some of the reasons I enjoy it. But I think I like trick taking games that are like hearts where it is. The rules are set in stone, but then I like games like Nyet, where every hand is different, and I have to adjust to what's happened. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, the, the trick-taking part in Nyet is very straightforward. It's like typical play, follow suit. If you can't, you have to trump, I think. like It's very straightforward, trick-taking. But yes, that, that preamble to every hand, where you are taking away possibilities of this will not be trump, I will not be start player, we will not score this money points per right. hand. That's that's what makes it. I, I agree. My yeah. only caveat is if somebody is a slow at analysis paralysis person, I refuse to play this game with them straight out because they will drag that first part of each round out to an unfun thing. And, it's and again, yeah. And again, that's why it drops down. But if everybody's just having a good time, yet can yet you're right. It when you play it, it's very straightforward, but it feels different. It feels like it's a different kind of game. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Good stuff. Good stuff. Ziza, Ziza, approving me. <laughs> so far. Number eight. My number eight is uh, an oldie but a goodie, in my opinion. It's a game from, I want to say, early 90s, maybe 1990. It's a, a game called uh, Trumpet. 
It's one, uh, I don't know how many people know it, but it's one that has a board. You are going to be uh, using the board to move around as you are scoring. There's a couple of neat ideas on that board. That is, you leapfrog other people. So if when you win a trick, there are a couple of pawns lined up in front of you, you can leap right over them. That's good. There's also, as you are making your way onto spots across the that scoring track, when you land on specific spaces, you can make some suit trump. Okay? Uh, it's like a six-suited deck as well. So let's say I make crowns trump. Great. For now, we are playing then the crowns of Trump, and as soon as anybody lands on another one of these lo spots, it, it looks like a roll and move track, right? As soon as anybody lands on another one, they make another suit Trump to that one and everything else. So eventually, all the suits are ranked. And the trick-taking on top of that is pretty straightforward. You just follow suit if you can. If you cannot, slough off and see what wins the hand. That's a different I like game. I like it a lot. It is uh, simple. It's a great family-style trick-taking game. Quick, straightforward. It has a track, so that part of it feels very familiar to people that are used to roll-and-move games. You know, you're moving your pawn. Farther ahead is better. Great. Closer to the end is, is what you want. I enjoy it. I think it's a, a nice one. It's one that I wish would be reprinted with nicer components. Unfortunately, this, in English anyway, hasn't come out since, like I said, the 90s. And it was not a great looking production. But I really like it. I, I much like uh, Tim was talking about Pacoco, him having a, a bit of a soft spot for it. I got to say, I, I got a soft spot for Trumpet. I wish this would come back. So that's my number eight. I don't yeah. know if you guys have heard of it or played it before. Well, you talk about it. You're always trumpeting the praises of this game. <laughs> oh, Tom. Who was the comedian, Tim or you? Dad joke. <laughs> Yeah. All right, Tim, what do you got? So my number eight, uh, this is uh, the first crossover I have. Um, like I said, the first. And uh, that is Diamonds. So uh, we already talked about this one with Z. Uh, he had this at number 10. I had it just a little bit higher at number eight. And the reason I did is because um, I like more of the traditional trick-taking games. And this still sort of kept that aspect as well as all of the other stuff we're talking about. It added the gimmicks, of course, of the little gems and things like that. But just the fact, like we had already discussed, that the player who loses the tricks, you know going in, I'm not going to win that trick, but now I have options. Mm -hmm. What should I play? What action do I need to take? That is just so cool. I think that uh, Mike just did a fantastic job with this game. Yeah, he really did. Really agreed. Good. Agreed. And you can, you know, if you if you look, take a look at your opening hand, you only have, uh, you know, one diamond. Get rid of it, so you can short suit yourself, and then, you know, then you can start making, you know, bonus actions. I like it a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then, if you know you need to, like, you've got a big pool in front of your vault, and whatever suit that is, and you're like, yeah, I really need to get those back. You just like, you know, whatever, like you're saying, short the other suits to get start, you know, sloughing those off. To take yeah. that out. Yeah, it's it's, he, it's great. It's good. You'll right. notice at this point, if you're watching this and you don't play many trick-taking games, uh, there's a lot of terms we're throwing around. We got tricks. You know, everyone plays a card. Whoever wins it, that's what you call a trick. Um, slough off is getting rid of cards that you don't want. You're just giving them to somebody else. You don't help them out, but they're getting them out of your hand. And trump is usually a, a, a suit that's better than the rest of the suits. It trumps the other ones. This term was around many, many years before the last four years for sure. Um, and yet every time I talk about a trick-taking game, someone comes in and goes, stop politicizing everything. I'm like, come on, guys. <laughs> I say that because my number eight is called Trump Tricks Game. And this may be one. I don't think Z actually likes this one. I had never played it. I know what you're talking about. I, I remember the cover distinctly with that uh, elk or whatever, but I've never played it. This one... The thing I like about it is the gimmick of the game is what makes it for me is that you're going to win a certain number of cards each round. And those cards you win in your tricks will be your hand for the second round. And it has a, a way so you don't win all the cards. And I have you're still going to have the same number of cards each each hand. And you're getting points based on what you win and things like that. This one looks pretty boring. It was, I believe, made by Mayfair back in their uh, mediocre phase, which was a good, almost the whole run of the company. But 
Um, ah, whatever. But it is a fun one, and I love the concept of playing cards to then win them. Like, you know, if you put out good cards, but I put out a better card, I have all those cards in my hand for the next round. Well, if you put out some bad cards and I win them, well, I gotta, I'm stuck with those bad cards for the next round. So I like this one. It's been a while since I played it, but I, I enjoy a Trump Tricks game. Um, they did run out of, you know, they, I don't know what they were thinking when they named it this, you know. Like, put down some terminology. Well, we have a game, Reeve, that is not that old called The Game. So well, yeah, I, also, I, mean, I also think that's stupid. Well, yes. <laughs> it is. Very. Yes. Number seven. My number seven is, I would say, the other two-player trick-taking game. Not the Fox in the Forest. The only other one I can think of. It's a game called Claim. And Claim is a two-player only card game. Uh, that does something very similar to what you're talking about, Tom, with uh, Trump's Tricks game, whatever that one's called. Uh, you are <laughs> playing, you play two hands. A hand is made up of however many tricks, okay? You're dealing out, I don't know, 10 or 11 or 12 cards. You'll play through the entirety of phase one, leading, following, all of that, collecting those cards into a group. And then the uh, the second part of the game, you are picking that up and then playing with that, Okay. Uh, more or less. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping over things. The neat thing in this game is that the suits have powers, and they are things like uh, doppelgangers and uh, elves and goblins and knights and things like that. And they each will have a specific power associated with them. Some of those powers happen during the first half of the game, phase one. Some of them happen during the second part of the game. Some of them mean that if you, you know, this one card always takes out that one. You want to, the doppelganger will copy the other guy. The knight takes out the goblin. All sorts of things. They have expanded this game galore at infinitum, right? I mean, like, there's a lot of, of, of expansions to it with new powers, new abilities, new groups. But I enjoy it a lot. It's got a good rhythm to it. That first half, second half reminds me of things like For Sale. You know, it feels very snappy. This okay. is what we do now, then we do this. Boom. You are collecting majorities in the different suits is how you score. There's always five different kinds of cards. If you have majority in three of the five at the end of the game, you win. That's how you determine that. So it's neat. It's um, it's clever. It's engaging. And you can always pull out a suit you don't like and shuffle one in that you do like, assuming you have expansions. So uh, that is my number. Where are we at? Seven claim. Okay. Uh, my number seven is my first, uh, so I won't say how many, but my first of a trick-taking game from a standard deck of cards. Okay. Uh, this game I had wanted to play my whole life. Uh, it's, you know, just, it's been around for many, many, many years. I only started playing about two years ago, so I'm still relatively new, but I absolutely love it, and I just uh, regret the fact that it took so long for me to get this to the table, and that is Pinochle. Now, Oof. I thought he was going to say bridge. I was all nervous because I was going <laughs> to light into you. But all right, go ahead. Okay. So P-Knuckle um, is just a really fantastic trick-taking game. Again, it has the several levels to it, like I had mentioned in Pococo. So the first part, what you are doing is it has different combinations. It's got like a marriage. It's got a P-Knuckle. Um, it's got runs. It's got the Ds. It's got different combinations. And you're sort of um, – everybody can play those and score those. But you go around bidding because whoever wins the bid also gets to try to enhance their meld points by the actual trick-taking uh, part of the game. So after you all you know, determine that, you do the meld, you score the points, and you actually pass. Uh, there's different variants, of course, whether it's just partners or you know team members or whatever. And then you go ahead and play a regular trick-taking game. And then there's different rules like you must trump and all these different variables to it. But uh, as far as a classic card game, this is one uh, that I really love from a trick-taking uh, from a trick-taking aspect. And I wish I had played more. And I always do want to play more. So anytime we're at a convention, please pull me aside. I'll be more than happy to play Pinochle with you. Hmm. I think it was about. Only five years ago, where I realized that Pinaco and Pinacho were the same game. Uh, the 
<laughs> well, no, I seen it spelled online. I heard people say P knuckle. I just assumed it was P E A and then the word knuckle. You know, how was I supposed to know? P um, Mitchell? Are you? <laughs> that's that is not grammatically obvious from how that that yeah, game is spelled at all. How do you say that? P knuckle. <laughs> I'm not. I'm saying that's what I said in my head. All right. Let me ask you this stuff, Tim, because you mock my. Uh, <laughs> so, I say we lost him. We lost him. <laughs> That's not even that funny. It really is spelled poorly. Anyway, <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> okay, so my question now, Tim, is the thing that kind of scares me off about Pinochle is the <laughs> the culture <sighs> behind it. So this is the same thing I have with Bridge or even with games like Whist or something where there's a group, you know, the people who play it, I'm almost afraid to go because it feels like I won't know all the in rules and everything. Mm-hmm. Is that the, did you find it to be that way when you first got in? Was it kind of like, as you enter in, you don't know when to do all these different things and it takes a while to learn or were the people very welcoming who taught you? Oh, absolutely, Tom. I would agree with that. However, you can say the same thing necessarily about board games, right? I mean, if you have, if you go to say a convention, there's going to be those people who are going to be intimidated because, oh, I don't know all the terminology. I don't know this. I don't know that. I, you know, blah, blah. And, and I just feel it's, it, it equates the exact same. But yes, I would agree. There are those people who are hardcore um, pinochle players who, yeah, they know all the rules, ins and outs. And there are little fiddly things, intricacies in it, that, yes, you do need to play it quite a bit to become proficient at it, which I'm not nowhere near. So, yeah, I would agree with you there. You're probably better than me. At least you know how to say it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. If you're, a fan, s- if you're a fan of uh, Pinocchio, you're, you're known colloquially as a Pinocchio. That's how people... <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Leo. <laughs> right. Go ahead, Tom. What you my number seven is a game that has had many names when i first played it we called it die steven seagal um although it's actually like die seven seagull but the seven, everyone the seven I, seals yeah the okay. seven seals but then they renamed it as zing or slough off uh, there's a lot of different names for this but essentially this is the quintessential game it was the first one i ever ran into where you were basically predicting how many tricks you would take this is not the only game to do this now by a mile there's a lot of games that do this uh and it's i'm not even saying it's the first but it was most well known for it and i really like that like i'm gonna win one red trick two green tricks or you could say something to effect i'm gonna just ruin other people (laughs) there's always one person can just say i'm gonna mess up everybody else and it's one of the more cutthroat trick-taking games that's out there and it's very difficult to get your predictions right, but when you do get them right, it feels so good. I just like this one a lot. So Zing or the Seven Seals, I really like this one. I don't think you like this one, though. Z. I like it, yeah. Yeah, I used to own Zing from Fun Again. <laughs> uh, and I like the simplicity of the trick-taking. I, I, I don't mean the, 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 the play. It is easy. But what I mean is when you bid, you just take the tokens that match the tricks you expect to take. Right. You take, like, so, two red tokens and one blue token and a green. And then when you win a red trick, you can just put the token back. And then once the hand is fully over, you take a look down. Are they all gone? Great. You did what you set out to do. You still got some left? You're going to lose some points. I like that. I like that simplicity a lot. I thought that was really neat. So, yeah, I like Zing. That's a good one. It didn't make my true. list. That's You and I good. recently, we played a trick-taking game. Uh, a couple of years ago with the Sam, I forget what it was, but it, it did the same thing, but it was much more complex and you had to keep track of, I'm going to win this trick, but I'm not going to win this one. I'm going to, you know, there's a little bit more confusion there. Yeah. Yeah. Number six. All right. For my number six, uh, well, I've got a crossover here with Mr. Vassal. This is Tom Niet. Uh, I played Niet yeah. back in the day when it came out as uh, part of the Mew and Mew and Lots More set. It was one of the games in that set. But then I got the standalone edition of it, the one from Yellow. And it's a beautiful production. Uh, they both were. And yeah, it's it's that fun sort of... 
I, I just love the idea of denying, like sort of, you know, coming to a conclusion about something by taking away options until you refine it down to a single choice. You know, the, the simplest thing is, like you said, trick take the, the Trump. I, I, you know, I put out a token that says it won't be red. And then you put out a token that says it will not be yellow. And eventually we narrow it down to it being blue or whatever. I love that. It's just so cool. This reverse, you know, psych psychological sort of uh, exercise. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is neat. It's a little long for me. That's my only complaint about it. I think it's a little long. You know, it's, it's typically too many hands for me. But other than that, it's a fantastic game. Well, let me ask you that as an aside here. Do you both play trick-taking games to their natural conclusion? I just normally play them till we feel like we're done playing them. Unless it's a very set four hands. But if it's like the first to 300, 400 points... I'll just be like, eh, we played for a while. We're good. That happens to me a lot when I'm playing trick-taking games. Oh, no, I, I, yeah, I mean, I do. And there's some still coming up that, yeah, you, you play your conclusion. Absolutely. <laughs> I ideally, I, I, you know, ideally want to play the game that somebody designed. And they say you play to 300 points, then I play to 300 points. Are those games usually too long? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, but some of my... So some of the ones at the top of my list are shorter for that very reason. They have more sensical endgame points. But we'll Got get it. to that. Right. right. But also in that discussion, Tom, I would say, like, if you look at a game like, say, Rummy 500, right? You know, 500 points, you know, and I'm sure most of us played that when we were younger. Um, we didn't maybe have a lot of options. But when you sat down to play Rummy 500, you knew that was your evening. So yeah. it you did play it. No. I would be like, you know what? Let's just play to 200. <laughs> Nobody plays Rummy 200, Tom. Yeah, it's Rummy 500, or you get out of my house. Uh, there you go. Uh, yes, I'll see myself out. <laughs> All right. So, uh, what are we on? Number one, two, three, four, five, five. Uh, no, six. Nine, six. Eight. So uh, I gotta count yeah. back. Six. All right. So uh, I'm going to uh, bring up my number six, which is going to start to open up this conversation that we sort of alluded to at the beginning of the segment. Uh, my number six is Klaus Kediot. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, uh, but uh, crazy checkers or combo checkers, or I don't know the exact German translation. They have a new name for it now. I want to say they renamed it something just recently. I don't know. How do you spell it? I'll look it up. K-R-A-S-S, -S, I believe. Yes. K-R. Found it. I E R T, I believe it is. The English name is Delt. That's very boring. That's it. Delt is what they renamed oh, it. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Um, so again, this is this. You know, uh, who, who knows? I mean, as gamers, right? As nerds, like we are, we could sit here for a whole hour and debate whether technically or not this is a trick-taking game. I, I don't think it's going to take that long, Tim. Uh, it's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Okay, Tom, go ahead. You're number six. <laughs> <laughs> what? This is, this is going to be quick. This is easy, then. Uh, <laughs> Again, now, I just said for me, a lot of people do consider these in the same family. So you do you. We'll, we'll wait till we're done and, we, and we're done with the Skype call before me and Z mock you more. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, again, it probably isn't. You know, again, but anyway, um, I do love cross carry. I love the fact. So the the idea of cross carry uh, to me was a new mechanic I had never faced before. That you deal the cards out, you can mix them up and shuffle them. You can't look at them, but once you pick up your cards, you cannot rearrange the order. So Ooh. how you play combos or whatever out of your hand, single cards, is set by what you pick up and look at. So the intriguing part and the interesting part of that is if you have, say, a, uh, a six, uh, eight, a six, two, eight, nine, right, on a possible turn, you might want to singly play the two if it's allowed because it does have that climbing aspect or shedding aspect. Now all of a sudden you've got the six, oh, I'm sorry, six, seven, eight, together, or a run together. So that way, you know, you can manipulate your cards by how you play them. Sure, and then sure. you've got the two cards in front of you that are sort of your outs. Um, and you play like to eliminate, not get eliminated per round. Um, so yeah, it probably technically isn't. And Z, you could probably educate me a little bit more, but I did put it in here because I, I felt it sort of belonged on this list. I would say it's definitely a, sh a card shedding game. Uh, you are, and it's an elimination one, right? You don't want to be, you don't want to bust. You want to be able to follow and, and sort of, you know, 
So the objective is not necessarily to completely shed your hand. It's not rummy, but it is sort of staying alive, and you are trying to continue playing. If you pass you know, too many times, you're, you're, you bust. So I would say, yeah, it's a, it's a ladder climbing or, or card shedding kind of game. I agree with you. It's a very good game, though. I wish it looked different. It's not a great graphic design, but it is a good game. And that that concept of not being able to rearrange your hand, uh, I've seen in a couple of places, but it is rare. And this one does it in a dist- in a you know unique, distinct way. Right. Yeah, very good. I've not played it, Tim, so you're right with everything you said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for your backing. I appreciate that. <laughs> My number six, I feel like, would be the most controversial for people who played it, because I could see some people like trick-taking games really disliking it, and that's Druids. Druids is from Amigo. I don't know if you've played this one, Z. I don't uh, think so. So the way Druids works is when you play, when you win a trick, you put the cards in front of you, and you put the lowest card on top of each color. So if I win, so I might be winning a trick, and I'm like, ooh, I'm going to get a lot of points, and Tim throws out a yellow one. Okay, fine. I'm getting one point from yellow at that point in time. Um, okay. And we keep going till all the cards have been played, and or if at any point one person has a card in all five colors, there's five suits. If one person gets a card in all five colors, then boom, the round's over. That person gets negative points, and everyone else gets the positive points for the top card in each color. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that there could be a lack of satisfaction, <laughs> like ah, oh, I'm having a good hand going. And Tim's like, wow, I'm not winning this one. I got five colors. Boom, round's over. You know? And I like it, though, because it's tricky because you know how you slough off a lot in games. In this Mm -hmm. game, sloughing off actually affects somebody. Z's winning the yellow one. I'm like, wow, you're getting the lowest yellow card there is now. And I I found this one to be be very interesting. I don't know if this one came out in English, um, but it's by Gunter Burkhardt, one of the designers. And he's done a lot of really good games. Um, A lot of trick-taking games, too. He has. In fact, his my number 11 was Potato Man, which was one he's done, which is a stupid theme. Shows a super potato guy on it. But uh, I like game. that one, too. Yeah, so my number yeah. six is Druids. All right. I'll, uh, sounds good. Number five. My number five is a game from Matthias Kramer, or Kramer uh, and this is a game called, in English anyway, Plums. In German, it was called uh, P. Malflaumen. You might know it by that name as well. And this one is a very interesting sort of set collection-y and recipe fulfillment kind of trick-taking game in which you are you're playing over three eras, three stages, following, you know, leading, following, all of that stuff. All the cards are, they're, they're not suited. They're just sort of sequentially numbered. And then some of the cards have, recipes you're trying to fulfill like i said so it's basically the idea of oh you want a you know uh aaa type cards okay great the cards some of them have fruits on it so if i get strawberry 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 i can fulfill that recipe boom and get some points so it might be two pairs a a b b great if i do that i i will bank those points it's got a lot going on in it it's pretty thematic in sort of a bizarre naturalist kind of way. It's about fruits and insects, and you know, it's got a weird in, uh, sort of theme to it. But um, the gameplay feels distinct. It's it's really different. Uh, Matthias Kramer, as a designer, is 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 clever, is interesting, and this is a really cool outside of the box kind of trick taking game. Unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people played it, but. Um, Plums is one I would certainly recommend if you're looking for something different while still being a trick-taking game. I do like eating plums, so I assume I'll like this. Absolutely. One-to-one comparison, Tom. Thanks for adding to the conversation. I just got to say something. Tom Thumb with the plum. There you go. Um, Thumb thumb with the plum. Thumb with the plum. I gave you Uh, a thumb. All right. I'm not a dad, and I made a Tom joke. Um, Here we go. So... (laughs) <laughs> Did he call it a Tom joke? <laughs> That's basically what I call dad jokes. That's not what everybody calls dad jokes. Yes, Tom I, jokes. Tom, I called it a Tom joke. <laughs> All right. I'm so glad so, to be here. Um, this car, this uh, next uh, game on here is another 
game from a regular deck of cards. I just learned this at the last gathering in uh, 2019 at like 2 in the morning, and uh, it totally blew my mind. I was like, I cannot believe I did not know about this game. Anyway, it's called 99. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of it or played it, but please. Oh, no, 99. No, just straight called 99. Huh. I don't know. Yes, called 99. Now, the general concept, again, is a regular deck of cards. However, you eliminate the two, three, and four, the two, three, four, and five. So you're only playing with a 36 card deck, six through ace. Now, so with the cards in your hand, you have nine cards in your hand. What you're going to do then is you're going to bid how many tricks you're going to take in the round. But the interesting part of it is, is the suits have values, okay? So a diamond is zero, um, a spade is one, a heart is two, and a club is three. So now you must get rid of three cards. The three cards you get rid of are how many tricks you're going to take. So for example, if you get rid of three clubs, that says you're taking nine tricks because each club is worth three. If you get rid of three diamonds, you're gonna take zero tricks. Okay. The really interesting part is you have to manipulate, mitigate, whatever term you want to use, your bid determined on the cards in your hand, right? So you don't like you like you have to just work with what you got because you may have to get rid of like two mm. clubs and a spade. So that would be seven tricks you're taking, but that's the only card you can. You know, it's just so interesting. Uh, a regular deck of cards, ninety nine. Um, it, it's absolutely fascinating, and I think anybody who likes trick-taking games out of a regular deck of cards especially should really look this up and play this one. Yeah, I'm looking at it here online, it looks like it did get, it's from uh, designer David Parlett, who I, I don't know what else he's done, but it looks like it's been um, reprinted in a themed deck of cards, I mean a themed product, as a game called Four Seasons. So if anybody's played a game called Four Seasons... It's based on 99. Huh. Oh, I All did, right. did not know that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe looks, I would try this nice. one out, Tim. It sounds interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I learned it as specifically a three-player game, and I think it might have been designed as a three-player game. However, there are variants that you can play with two uh, other uh, player counts as well. Well, cool. Cool. on that note, my number five is best played with three. It is my – if I have three players, well, this is one of the trick-taking games I would pick – Three, and this one I'm is, assuming this is uh, for three. It has to be Bottle Imp. That is correct, the Bottle Imp. This one I like. This one is a weird trick-taking game in that there is – the cards are, like, numbered from 1 to 30, I believe. or Yeah, 1 to 36, actually. But every card is red, yellow, or blue, and you have a little card that shows you because that's really important. You have to follow suit, um, but if you win – you can always play a really low number to win. There's a certain barrier, and if you play below that barrier, you win the trick automatically. If you play the highest card under that barrier. The problem is you also get the bottle, and you don't want the bottle because you lose that hand. If you end the, if you end the hand with a bottle, in fact, you get negative points. Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on a Robert, Robert Louis Stevenson's short story about selling a bottle, and, and you had to... Uh, you gave up your soul if you had this bottle but it gave you whatever you wanted but when you sold it to somebody else you could sell it for a lower price so you keep getting lower and lower so if you win the bottle with the one card you're stuck with it right so you're trying if you get the one at the beginning of the game you're thinking i need to get rid of this one and not win the bottle at a certain point in time so i really enjoy this a lot it's probably the most thematic trick-taking game that exists because it does a good job at bringing this story to a game um I like it. Stronghold Games just reprinted this a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, before that, it was done by um, like Diet Evil Games, I think, did it? Uh, I don't remember. Did Amigo not have a version of this at some point? Probably. Oh, sure. I, I meant the English versions. Z-Man, I think, may have touched it at some point. There's a lot of companies that have gone through this one, but I really enjoy it, the bottle imp. My number four was Tim's number 10. This is The Fox in the Forest. And I agree with everything you said, Tim. I um, I think it's a great two-player game. It feels more classic than Claim. Claim feels more gamery, right? It feels 
you know, less uh, like a trick taking game and more like a modern game that uses trick taking for set collection. But the Fox in the Forest is absolutely a trick taking game and it is very traditional. It's uh, charming. It has this idea of you don't want to win too few tricks because you don't score very many points. You don't want to win too many tricks because then the game classifies you as greedy. There's a sweet spot in the middle somewhere. And that's really neat. The, the, the fact that you have to try to sort of manipulate, you know, what you're in with when you're out, when you use a couple of the special abilities on the car is to come in right at, you know, six tricks or whatever. Great. Got it right on point. I like it a lot, man. It's beautiful, engaging. This is a, a fantastic two-player only trick-taking game. Yep, so that's my I, number four. Yeah, and I agree. Like I said, it was already on my list. And yeah, just to reiterate or to amplify a little bit more of what you said, Z, is yes, because... In your mind, when you start the hand or the round, you're like, okay, I want to take this many tricks because I want to score those points. Right. But things may not turn out the way you expected, so you have to mitigate exactly what you're playing because you want to fall in those certain ranges. So, yeah, that adds a whole really cool aspect to it as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so number four for me is another game out of a regular deck of cards. Uh, that I have on my list, so that makes three. Poker. No, this Poker, was, no. this is this is uh, I'm following sort of along with Z because this is a crossover. This was Tom's number ten, and that is Woo! yes. Um, I was so surprised, Tom, that you put this at ten because I, I got this at four. I love Hearts. Hearts to me is such a fantastic trick taking game because not only like you know we already talked about you either want to take all of the tricks or all of the points or none of the points you know you don't want to take the queen of spades especially all that but also the passing is such a huge part of the game so I, each I round in hearts you each round in hearts what you do is there are four different types you pass to the left you three cards okay you pass three cards to the left one round three cards across three cards to the right and then the fourth round or every fourth round you have a hold hand so you just have to play with the cards you were dealt with. So that adds a whole nother aspect uh, to it. And again, what I had talked about earlier, getting into counting how many cards have been played, which suits have been played. Oh, for sure. <laughs> trying to determine who you think has the queen by what they're not playing, what they're leading, because you never want the queen to get dropped on you, right? So it's just got so many levels to it. Uh, that I really, and, and to be honest with you, I had never played, I even really heard of the Jack of Clubs variant you talked about um, with Hearts. So I'd like to try that one time. Yeah, it's just one change, right? It's a positive 10 points. So it just adds a little bit of, to the game where you try to get that card, right? Um, I can't remember if you need that card to shoot the moon or not. I, I don't remember. Um, but uh, I wish more trick-taking games had to pass a card thing. I like that because it gives you some information it gives you the chance to, like, oh, I don't want this card in my hand. Although it's really funny when you're like, I only have one of this suit. You pass it, then you get another one. You get one mm -hmm. card of that suit back. Or, or you uh, get, like, another term you didn't bring up, Tom, was void, right? So in hearts, one of the big things you want to do is void yourself of a suit so you can slough off. And voiding means having a zero. So with that, like you said, sometimes you can pass the only three diamonds you have to get void, and all of a sudden you get three diamonds back. Oh, that always happens. That's why I right, don't play right. with people who are going to be jerks to me like that. I call it short suiting yourself, but yeah, voiding yourself. I never suit. heard the term void before, but I will use it now because it sounds cool. Uh, and uh, Bottle Limp's got passing cards, Tom, so you must like that about it as well. Oh, you're you always right. have that. You always have that whole like, I got the one. Do I pass it? I'm going to get the two probably. So, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Right. Like, it's that trickiness to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, my number four is the hardest one on my list to get. It was made in, uh, I believe, Argentina. I played it with Z one time because I really liked it, and it's called Gangsta, uh, which <laughs> is not – it's about gangsters. I don't know why it's called Gangsta, but They're this cool. game is really different than most trick-taking games. The actual trick-taking part of it is pretty simple. You play a card, and you can win, although there's some weird things like you could play – two fours if you have two together at the same time. But when you win a trick, you place these cards in a grid in the middle of the table. There's this grid that you're building, and as you place the cards out, that's how you score points. So if mm -hmm. I put cards next to each other, so you're watching, you might not want to win a trick because the cards you win don't help you at all in the grid. Well, if I play a card that clearly gives points out, so a lot of trick-taking games, 
the cards are worth points on them. Sometimes they're marked, sometimes it's whatever. In this case, the cards are going to change point values based on what's already on the table. And it, it adds almost a board game feel to the trick-taking game. This one has never been picked up by anybody else that I've ever seen, but I really like it. I actually, when I first started the Dice Tower Essentials line, this was on the short list of games I wanted to do. It just, trick-taking games are hard to sell. So there's that. But Gangsta. Were you, you going to keep the name Gangsta? Well, um, yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> or are you going to call it Cholo? Not, nothing personal, the trick-taking game. <laughs> nothing personal, the, the card game. is. Yeah, that would work. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Did you just say Cholo, Z? Is that what you that's said? right, baby. Because <laughs> I used to live in Albuquerque. And that's, uh, yeah, so I haven't heard that term in a long time. Wow. <laughs> uh. Number three. My number three is the cutest game on my list by far. It is a game from the same guy who designed uh, Trekking the National Parks, and it's a game called Pups. And I bring that up because his game design sensibilities and his company's style is very much family weight games, right? That's, that's what he's going for. These are easy to get into, simple, straightforward. Uh, this one has a bunch. It, it's got, I think, four suits. It's got adorable little illustrations of different puppy dogs. And you are bidding at the beginning of each hand as to how many you are going to take. A couple of things that make it a little bit easier than you most bidding games. And by that, I mean less punishing. You can, when you grab a bidding card, it says on one side, you're going to take exactly three tricks. Great. You can take that and bid that you're going to take three or you can flip that, make fewer points, but it says on it that you'll take at least three tricks. So if you go above, you're fine. You're just making fewer points. Also, if you bust a card, you say, I'll take exactly three. You bust that. You take it as negative points. You can rebid that one later on and hope to rebank it as positive points if you make it. Uh, that's nice. There's also one suit in the entire deck that he calls the mutts. They're not pure breeds. They're the mutt uh, suit. And those can be their own suit, but you can also add it to another suit. Hmm. So I can play a five in working dogs and add a plus two in mutts, and that's a seven working dog. So it has a little bit of that card combination idea in it as well. Really like it. Simple, straightforward, beautiful, cute. This is going to go over like gangbusters with folks that don't necessarily play trick-taking games and want to try it out. This is a good one to, to open that door. So there you go, my number three, Pups. Okay. <clears throat> well, my I number three. I have not played that one. Yeah, I haven't either. Never even heard of it. I'll have to look that one up. Uh, my number three is really interesting. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit of story. When I went to San Francisco you know, quite a few years back several times, uh, in Chinatown, in the park there, I would always see all these people sitting around playing cards. And I was like, wow, they're so intriguing. So I'd go up and try to watch, but I had no idea what they were doing. Then when I actually went to the country China, I would see the same thing in some of the big cities on corners. There'd just be a whole bunch of group of people playing cards. Uh, what I found out they were playing after doing research was a game called Big Two. Now, a game based off of Big Two comes in at number three for me, and that is Tishu. Now, again, we... <laughs> Okay, that's a long way to get to teach you, but yes, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, because some people don't know that, that it is based off of Big Two. Um, it's the well, same. so it's Gang of Four, right? M many of these games are based on that game played in China. Oh, okay, right. Um, yeah, and, it, and it, it's true, like they say in the back of Tishu, right? Like, you know, if there's a billion people in China, like, you know, 800 million of them play Big Two. You know, it's kind of like, you know, war here in America or gin rummy or something. Everybody plays it. Um, it's so popular. But... Uh, Tishu is just a fantastic game, uh, partnership, um, primarily. You can play non-partnership, but I just don't think it's as good or as fun as or interesting. It is a climbing, shedding game uh, where you're trying to get rid of your cards. You're trying to be the first ones to go out, the first partnership to go out. There's a whole lot of dynamics you must follow, you know, depending on whether it's a triplet or, uh, you know, a flush. I mean, uh, yeah, I um full house or whatever but uh it's so great as a partnership game and i absolutely love tissue yeah this is the one i was talking about at the beginning i know z knew i was talking about it yeah. uh 
we call these for those watching. We we said they're shedding games, ladder climbing games, where you're trying to get rid of all the cards in your hand. Tichu combines that with trick taking. It's a. Uh, I feel like it's part of both. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Tichu's fine. I enjoy it. I've been put off by Tichu because it's the people I run into at conventions who play Tichu take it so seriously that I can feel it three tables away. Yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know that I've met a non-serious teacher player, and in fact, I am somewhat suspect of Tim at this point in time. <laughs> well, no, I'm going to tell you, of course. Well, but but again, Tom, it's one of those kind of things when you say, yeah, I, I know what you mean about serious, but when you're playing board games, there's some people the same way who really get into the board game are really serious. You can feel that tension as well. I mean, I agree with you. Tissue players are sort of a whole nother. Well, that's because teach is a partnership game. So I, one of the games, I didn't put this on my list, a popular trick to game is Rook. And my parent, my my in-laws love Rook. My wife loves Rook. My wife likes Rook so much when we were in college, she refused to be my partner because I wasn't good enough. <laughs> She'll marry me. She'll marry but you. She won't be my partner in Rook. And she, her brother, and her parents are all the same way. Uh-huh. And it sounds <laughs> like maybe this is why you got into board gaming. I gotta tell you. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta get you on the couch. You know? Now, um, by the way, someone in the chat is saying that, that that makes us a cooperative game. It does not. Uh, um, a partnership game is not cooperative. You might be There's tons you of might partnership be, trick taking games. You might be a partner with the person across from you, but you're definitely not cooperating with everyone else at the table. Oh. And in fact, as I found out, I'm not cooperating with my partner, and they yell at me a lot. Yeah, and but, also, yeah. Also, what's good about Tissue is like we had talked about. We all agree with. We really enjoy. It's got that passing element, right? Mm-hmm. You've got to pass a single card left, right, and across. So it adds that little dynamic to it as well. All righty. Let's get to my number three. For me, when I made this list, I it was actually kind of like when I got to four on down, I was like trying to figure out which games were going to go where. But my one through three were solid. Very easy to pick. My number three used to be my number one, um, but it, I still like it a lot. That's David and Goliath. A very simple trick-taking game. It plays just as well with three as it does with six, which is really weird. You play a card. Everyone else follows suit. But it's the... Whoever plays the highest card wins everything except for their own card, which is won by the person who plays the lowest card. David kills Goliath, and Goliath kills everybody else. And then you get points for each card you take, but if you get more than two, they're worth only one point each. Otherwise, they're worth the face value on the card. Right, and if you're playing with six people, there's an 18 card in that deck. So if I get the 18 and 17, I got 35 points. So your goal then is to make me take one more card of that color, and now I have three. And I hate yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. This is one of the easiest games to teach people who don't play trick-taking games, I think. It's very simple. Um, it comes in a lot of different forms. It's been published by many different companies. It seems like this one's always in print by somebody somewhere. But yeah. I like it a lot. David and Goliath. It's a neat one. It's definitely good for a group. Like you said, I think it plays three to six well. I like it with more. Probably because I don't have a lot of choices for trick taking at say six. Right. Uh, I used to own this one and got rid of it because the production, uh, the, the the version I had had the mice. Remember the, they have one with like little mouse and then it gets all the way. You know the higher car has like a really giant mouse. Some of the colors were problematic in that printing, but the game is solid and I agree with you. I think this is one that's very easy to bring to the table. All right, David and Goliath. Number two. My number two, I've never actually seen in English. I own a German printing, but I know it exists. Mm-hmm. I've seen the cover online. So while I've never seen it, there is a cover, and it's in English somewhere. It's called Monster Trick. I forget if I showed you this finally, Tom, or not. I know I've mentioned it before. Uh, Monster Trick, no. It's, I don't uh, remember it. The idea here is it's one of those concept trick-taking games right you've got those they're kind of like tricking games but now with stacking or whatever right is that weird <laughs> well this one the trick is the, <laughs> the the idea is that you are playing multiple hands at once on the table so on your turn you play a card to one of the tricks that's going and there can be i think three or four going at once you can play to one of them or you can start a new one and mark it as, you know, if you're the first one to play a card there, you are currently winning. 
So you put a token of your color there. And then the next player goes. And they can play to any of the tricks going. So when you when one finally has four cards, whoever wins it then banks that trick. That's hmm. the idea. That's how it works. That sounds really weird. It works very smoothly. Once you see it go around the table twice, you go, oh, okay, I get it. I just have to, you know, sometimes I don't want to win that one. So I'll just use that card to start another one over here, which I'll probably lose when it goes all the way around the table. Great. And so that's that's how it works. You only play three hands. There is a little bit of a predicting element to it. It's predicting how many tricks you're going to take. Uh, and I really like it. Uh, besides the gimmick of tricks going around, the other really cool thing about it is that you have three scoring cards. And one might be, say, three points, six points, nine points. Okay. You're going to arrange those on the table in front of you face down. When you take your very first trick, you flip over the first. When you take your second trick, that one gets hidden. You flip over the next one. Another trick flips over the last, and you hide the second. So if you put your nine in the middle, you won two tricks. But if you go over two, you better wrap around again to the nine. I am I'm confused. Yeah. It's fantastic. You're going to love it. I'm going to bring it over, Tom. And I'm going to throw it at you from at least six feet away. <laughs> Monster trick is my number two pick. Trick. All right. I'm going to have to check that one out, too. You seem to really love that one, Z. Yeah. Um, so my number two, I'm sure, uh, like Tom said, his one, two, and three were dead set. My one and two were dead set. And I'm surprised nobody's brought this up. So I'm going to guess that it may be higher on the list for both of you two but my number two is the crew now the reason my no uh the crew i sort of fell in love with because again as you guys have noticed i have three regular deck card games on my list because i just love those the crew to me added the for lack of a better term novelty of board games to a straightforward trick taking game and not only did they do it well i can't give enough praise or say enough good words for how well this game is designed the missions all scale like from one to 50 i haven't i mean i haven't played i've only gotten to 28 or 29 so i haven't played all 50 but i haven't found where there has been a misstep in like the elevation of each level i think it's oh just, yeah yeah i think it's just done so well and the way it's designed is it really is intended to get people i think to love tricking taking games but it's designed to teach people how to play mission one is boom this and it's 100 percent fully cooperative and it's the fully cooperative that i like where it's got hidden information so there is zero chance for an alpha player i mean i could go on and on and on i'm not going to Tim, i have clearly played this game with a trader before mostly someone who didn't know how to play trick-taking games <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> and you're like wait why did they just play that card are they trying to make us lose mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i think this one is really prone to that teach you thing i gotta tell you the whole like oh you don't know how to play so you're bringing the whole table down, and now everybody's like, oh, you did that? Well, I don't like that aspect of it. It feels like you either play correctly. It's like math. You either know exactly how to play, or you made a mistake. There's no wiggle room in the crew. I don't like that about it. You know what I mean? It just feels... I don't play for that reason. Like, if, I, if a robot can look at my hand and go, correct, 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 then why am I here? You know I mean, what I mean? I do agree with you, Z, and I see the exact point you're coming from. But again, I, I mean, I, I mean, let's look at a regular board game. Doesn't sort of the same thing can happen in that if you're sitting down to play a game that a four person game, say three of you know very well, and one other person, yeah, I played it once before. Can't in essence they sort of, sort of, you know, not make the game as fun as well, or no? Ideally, no. Ideally, I can still have fun without like you being a without you knowing exactly how to play. My, my point is not that, yes, you can be better or worse at games. Mm. There are gradients in most board games, is what I'm saying. 
I think in the crew, it's 0% or 100%. That's it. In some games, you can be like, you can make 68%, and that means you're making some bad moves. It's not really affecting me. I'm having fun. You know what I mean? That, that's that's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tom, this, right. is, this is definitely higher on Tom's list. I'm assuming it's not just his one. It might be his zebra. All right. My number two is a game that Z told me to play for a long time in the original form, and I didn't until Restoration reprinted it. Right. And that is Indulgence, which you said was originally Dragon Master. Right. Baby. And the, the reason I like this is simply because – I the like ring. my favorite part of hearts is shooting. That's <laughs> not the ring. Oh. Uh, I like shooting the moon. And this game is all about shooting the moon because one player is attempting to do that. And in fact, if you can shoot like all the moons, like there's different rules of play. If you could do all of them, you just win the game straight out. Yeah. I, I came one card within that one time. It's so exciting. <laughs> somebody and was just, asking, somebody was asking in the comments what shooting the moon meant. Uh, and that is basically you are trying to, win all the tricks or take all the scoring cards in some scenario, okay? It's yeah. based on whatever the game is, but you're trying to something it's a really long shot. If you manage to do it, you are rewarded, you know, with crazy amounts of riches. And usually, like for example in hearts, each heart is a negative point. If you get all the hearts though, everyone else gets points, negative points. But if you come one card within that, then you really had a bad hand. Yeah, the you closer know? you get, the worse you're in until you go right over and suddenly, ah. Yeah, so I really like Indulgence just for that reason. I mean, it's also a really nice production. Restoration Games did a great job. They streamlined it. It's just a lot of fun. That's my number two, Indulgence. Nice. And finally, number one. All right. My number one was somebody did guess it in the comments. And if uh, if you are that person, congratulations, you are correct. My number one is Eternity. A little trick taking game, a fairly unassuming Ooh. one. I like it a lot. It's simple. It's short. It's uh, very pretty. It's it uh, is indeed. It's uh, straightforward. It's one that you play three hands. It has this idea of following trying to win suits yes but one person maybe two if you play with a large group normally i play with four let's say i'm playing with four one person at the table gets to not add a card to the trick instead just put one sort of sideways in front of them and take a number of tree tokens these tree tokens go in a pool in front of them and for every trick they actually win they get to plant a tree on the back of that trick they have a little symbol you put a tree token on there. At the end of the entire hand, if you have exactly the number of tricks as tree tokens, you planted all of them, you're going to get a point per and a bonus. If you have more space than trees, you took more tricks, that's okay. You get one point per trick that you planted a tree on. But if you have too many trees, you score nothing. You have unplanted trees you get nothing at all for that. You play three hands. The bonuses go up. They escalate each hand. And then at the end of those three uh, full hands, you see who the winner is. That's it. That's all there is to it, pretty much. Uh, there is one other little twist, which is the card that somebody doesn't add to the trick. Instead, they just sort of lay in front of them. Gets, uh, gets uh, thrown onto a sideboard and determines trump. So the trump sort of evolves throughout the hand. I like it a lot. Beautiful, simple, elegant. Uh, if we if we want to go there, played this on the cruise. Really enjoyed it. Every time it comes out, it's just a, it's just hmm. pleasant, and it's short enough that it is not the the evening trick taking game as we said, Tim. It's sort of just a a nice palate cleanser for me. I like that about it. So my number one, Eternity. This was on my short list. I like it, but I ultimately determined that the beauty of it made it go a little higher than I might have put it otherwise. Okay. All right. Um, wow, that's your number one. I'm surprised I never heard of it. I have to go look that one up. Um, so my number one is, I'll just go ahead and say it, then Tom can light into me, is Bridge. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have never even played bridge. I, I've read all the rules and everything, but I have my standard responses. Go ahead. Yes. So I just want to give you a little brief history. So growing up, I was an avid board gamer, right? I'm sure most of us were, you know, Monopoly, sorry, you know, cribbage, backgammon, all that kind of stuff. And I literally thought I knew every game in the world, right? If I went into somebody's house, the games they had, I know how to play. You go into Toys R Us. Yeah, I know how to play them. Now I'm, you know, I just turned 57 actually. So I'm a little bit older in the comics. Every uh, Sun or Saturday, whatever it was, they had a section, Omar Sharif on bridge. And as I got into my early 20s, around 22, 23, I was like, you know what? That's the only game in the world, of course, I was thinking that, that I don't know how to play. I need to learn how to play it so that way I will know how to play every game in the world. Um, so I learned it. <laughs> well, um, you're not going to make this this quest, just so you know. Yes, I know, I know. Um, but I, I literally thought that, I really did. And so that's why I wanted to learn it. So I learned it and my mind was blown. It's just amazing. Now, Tom, you're absolutely right. If you go into a bookstore or a library, they have shelves, dozens of books written on bridge. Yes, you're hardcore, you're this, that. However, to me, how I approach bridge is how I approach the game of golf. And I'm sorry if you hear my cat back there, that's the world's loudest cat. Um, she's uh, just woken up, so she's kind of got a hungry. I got a cat, her. they're all bad, don't worry about it. Yeah, um, is with golf, right? I, I got into it. I loved it. I knew I finally got to the point where, you know what? I'm always going to suck. That's just how it is. So now when I go out and play golf, I have a great time because I just know I'll never be good. I enjoy it. And I, <laughs> I, okay, right? that's one way to look at it. But, I'm approach, but I approach bridge the same way because I'm trying to get to the point you made, Tom, is yes, they have tournaments, they have masters, they have all these big things, hardcore players. But I know, you know what? I'm never going to be that expert bridge player I'm never going to know all the conventions, everything. I'm going to be always just an average, minimal, moderate bridge player. So that way I play it. I love it. I enjoy it. And I just think it is the Cadillac of trick-taking games. I really thought you were going to say it's the cat's meow. But, um... <laughs> what a fantastic... Good dad joke! Oh! <laughs> Yeah, no, that's what it sounded like you were saying. I think it's the cat all lack. I was like, oh, okay, well. All right. You know what? I don't think I've ever played bridge. I want to say I don't. I haven't. I I'm gonna look into it, Tim. Well, the, I'm gonna read the. I'm gonna find it online, read the rules, and see what I think of that. And, and here's here's what's uh, if I could if you don't mind if I just talk a little bit more about it. Is that okay, Tom? Whatever. It's your it's your it's your video. Oh, no, no, but I just want to say the thing that I like about it is because of the conventions, right? It's sort of like open, not sort of, it is open table talk. Every bid means something. If I open one spade, that's not only telling my partner what's holding my hands, that's letting my opponents. And not only that, your uh, the opponents can freely ask, like if I bid one spade, the opponent could ask my partner, what does his bid mean? Oh, he's got five spades. He doesn't have a void. He has X amount of points, blah, blah, blah. You can tell me. So every bit of information is out there, and then it comes down to actually playing the cards and winning your bid. So to me, that is just so fascinating how to, to hmm. make decipher all of the information, get it, now play the cards, and try to complete the quest on each individual hand. I I'm sorry. Bridge is phenomenal. I've not I would actually... I would be the most annoying player at this because I would ask what everything means all the time. <laughs> and you'd be like, I, I bit this. What does that mean? <laughs> hey, I got to get up and feed my cat. What does that mean? <laughs> I would ask about everything. Okay, Tim, I'm not actually going to give you any garbage on that because Z has persuaded me that my number one is very similar to this fact, so I will say fine. My number one, though, by a mile, is the crew. Um, and I get what Z said. And I've discovered many, many times, I've taught this game to so many people who are new to trick-taking games, and it has nothing to do with experienced gamers. Like, I taught this to my in-laws, who sure. love trick-taking games, and they picked it up like that. I taught it to really experienced gamers who play almost no trick-taking games, and I felt like I was playing with an amateur, you know? And, and it's not their fault, right? right? But as the game progresses, you might be like... Mm. That being said, I don't care. Because when you play with people who do know trick-taking games, it, this game is elevated to an experience like none other. Everyone raves about the mind. Oh, we're all you know, reading each other's mind. With the crew, I feel like we are reading each other's mind. It is, you're calculating information. You played that card. That means you don't have this card. And, ah, oh, it's so good. 
And the thing I like about the crew is it's essentially 50 games. You know, I, I met somebody who said, what do you do when you finish Mission 50? I haven't even gotten past the 20s. I just I played the first. Well, the first one's really easy. But like the, even the third one, you, I played that one like 20 times now. And it's fun every time. People don't ask that about other trick-taking games. Like, oh, you played Hearts? What about Level 2? There is no Level 2. It's the same game. But the crew is like 50 different games. But the cooperative nature of it and the fact that you can give out one major piece of information and then how you play your hand is other piece of information. So I can't get on Tim's case about bridge because this is really the other side of the same coin. It's all that information that you're giving out and figuring it out together as a group. It's so satisfying when you win the crew. I love it. And when yeah. you lose, it's because someone made a mistake. <laughs> and it wasn't you, right? <laughs> no, it's it has been me for sure. There are times I play a card and instantly I'm like, no, well, too late now. And, yeah. and yeah. of course, there's also the cruise does have that same thing the mind does. Like how much information <clears throat> can you give people? Like, are you allowed to go? Oh, you just gave that information. I play it a little looser, I think, than most people do. But I love the crew. Yes. If you, if you sigh in my house while we're playing the crew, you get slapped. <laughs> yeah, There's but, a lot of danger about going to your house. I don't think I'm gonna I'm gonna be coming anytime soon. That's right. But also to go along with more of what you're saying, Tom. Yeah, because about how some of the missions have the communication turned off. So thematically, with the whole thing, how you're the crew. I mean, it's just he he did. I I think it's a guy who designed it, right? I forgot his name. I think so. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Anyway, but they, they did such a fantastic job with the game. Just everything. It, it's so impressive. It's it's really good. And okay. it deserved to win the uh, award. Thomas, Thomas Singh is the oh, designer. Oh, oh. Um, the, uh, for those of you watching, what are some trick-taking games that you think we should have mentioned, but none of the three of us did? And why did Z not pick the crew? He already explained it. But still. Hmm. Um all right, let's see. So, Tim, what you, you let me ask you, what about spades? You didn't mention spades. You you hit a lot of the major ones. Yes, and uh, spades, to me, is sort of, if bridge is like the Mount Everest, the pinnacle of trick-taking games, spade is sort of the foothills of trick-taking games. Because essentially, right, if you're talking about trump, there's only one trump. Um, now there's a lot of variants. Some people play with the 10 of diamonds, you know, the jokers and all that kind of stuff, but straight spades, there's just one Trump suit and that's it. So there isn't anything else added on. It's like, it's like as vanilla of a trick taking game as you can take. Um, and nothing wrong with it. Uh, I played a lot of spades, but, but that's why it's not on my list because it is to me sort of bridge and spades. All right, there's a lot of answers coming in here. All right, let's people. see. What do we got? Skull King. I don't like it. That's I think Skull effect. King is... Oh, you got a yoo and Yo-Ho and all that. And... Yeah, it's too many rankings. Like, this pirate beats that pirate, but then that's beaten by the siren, and then that siren's beaten by the super pirate. And also, it's one of those where you play, like, first hand, one card, second hand, two cards, all the way up to ten, get out of my house. No. Okay, about... we start at seven. <laughs> What about Tricky Tides? Tricky Tides is uh, very good. It did not feel like the game, the game's core was about trick taking. It's a pick up and deliver game with trick taking on top of that. That's that's why it didn't make the list. Someone mentioned Time Chase, which I'd like. Um, I haven't played it yet. This is the one where you go back in time and you can change the, something from a previous trick. It's a little, it's it's an interesting experience and I enjoyed it, but it felt too out there it's too weird for me uh, a lot of people mentioned euchre oh yeah yep. euchre's okay euchre's sort of like uh euchre is very uh it's a very on rails kind of trick taking game very yeah. simple it's one of those kind of games because uh, we do euchre at meeple but we have a euchre uh night and people who grew up in the south of the great lakes it's sort right. of mandatory that you know how to play euchre <laughs> that's right yeah i played a good amount of euchre in michigan when i was uh -huh. I was visiting there, but uh, yeah, Euchre kind of largely plays itself. It's more like a talking game. A lot of people mentioned Tournament at Camelot. If Sam had been here, that's what he would have mentioned for sure. Number one. That's his number one. Number one for sure. Um, the Let's see. Uh, Somebody said Pitch. Uh, I said Pitch I like. I like Pitch 6, yep. which uh, is probably my favorite sort of traditional-ish card game. 
I paid, played a lot of pitch in college. Uh, let's see. Uh, wow, there are, there are so many games. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing people mention like, oh, yeah, Gore's Maximus. That's a, that's an entertaining one, uh, but it just didn't make my top ten. It was. I list. Huh? list is a variation of sort of bridge, like a sort Wist, of yeah. Yeah. wizard. Uh, Jiraku is a, an area control based trick taking game. Pretty interesting. Um, oh yeah, I forgot about that one. Man, there's a ton, but a yeah. Lot. Anyway, if you're watching this later on, you can mention what what you like in the comments and type out why and let people read that. Um, and then if you like what someone else has typed out, thumb it up and we'll see which games get thumbed to the top. That's right. <laughs> Tim, yeah. thanks so much for coming on here. We really enjoy it. Check out his channel, Meepleville, for interviews with many different famous people in the board gaming industry. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Tom. And please, yeah, go to my channel, check it out, subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. And yeah, doing a lot of interviews with a lot of people in the industry. Thank you. And if you're in Las Vegas, you might as well swing by his cafe. He has the largest meeple in the world. Well, it's oh, actually cut out. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And you guys have both been there, too. So yeah, We have yeah. been there. So Great stuff. All righty, folks. Well, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. And I'm Tim Mativier. Thank you very much. Have fun gaming.